Welcome to Washington Legal Foundation's webinar. My name is Glenn Lamy. I am Executive Director and Vice President for Legal Studies here at the Foundation. For those of you not familiar with the Foundation, we are in our 47th year of free enterprise advocacy and education. These types of programs that we do are a part of our, our larger efforts to craft uh, public opinion and opinion among decision makers and uh, opinion leaders on a wide range of issues that affect the free enterprise system. The administrative effort we're going to be discussing today is profoundly antithetical to much of what Washington Legal Foundation has advocated for for nearly five decades. It's an effort that attempts to administratively amend a statute that Congress passed to enable greater innovation, a goal that the Bayh-Dole Act has definitely achieved under any type of, of, of measure. Um, the proposal would empower businesses to take rent-seeking actions against their own competitors, and it would allow bureaucrats to label as unfair a product price that reflects market realities. We're thrilled to have an expert panel with us today, and uh, our moderator is going to be Judge Susan Braden, who I will briefly introduce. Judge Braden was appointed in 2003 to the U.S. Court of Federal Claims and was designated as the court's chief judge in 2017. Since her retirement, Judge Braden has been appointed as public member of the Administrative Conference of the U.S., a fellow of the American Bar Association, and to the board of directors of several privately held companies. She's an adjunct professor in the Antonin Scalia School of Law's Center for Intellectual Property, X Innovation Policy. And Judge Braden is also a member of the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office's Public Patent Public Advisory Committee. And she, most proudly to us, sits on Washington Legal Foundation's Legal Policy Advisory Board. I will note that this session is being recorded. If you have questions, please use the Q&A function on the Zoom webinar toolbar. And we have provided in the link uh, some important resources related to our discussion today in the chat, including comments by uh, all of our uh, presenters today. Susan, I turn the floor over to you. Thank you, Glenn. And let me give a um, slight commercial for the Washington Legal Foundation. I was a member on their advisory board for 10 years before I went on the bench. And one of the first things I did when I retired was to see if they would take me back. They do terrific work. It, it, this is a business-oriented free enterprise group that it touches all segments of the economy. And they are very influential, particularly in filing amicus briefs in the courts of appeals and the Supreme Court of the United States. In addition, they have little policy one-pagers that go out to many of the uh, people that participate, many of which are general counsels of major corporations. So I strongly um, suggest that all the lawyers that are listening in uh, contact uh, Glenn and see how you can become involved. We're grateful to have this opportunity to talk about the new uh, March in Rights initiative of this administration. Um, I'm going to introduce each panelist right before they speak. I think that'll work better. Um, so for those that you don't know, we're going to, first of all, explain what the Bayh-Dole Act is. But it has been credited with providing over $12.3 trillion to the U.S. gross domestic product, creating 4.2 million jobs and enabling over 11,000 new startup ventures. So the question is, why do we want to change this? Um, Chief Judge uh, Paul Michel served for many years on the federal United States Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit, which has the um, exclusive jurisdiction over all patent uh, claims, at least at the appellate level, before they go to the Supreme Court. But more importantly, before that period of time, he served as a member of the staff on the Senate Judiciary Committee. And his expertise in both how the legislation legislature works and um, the law are um, invaluable. I would like to ask Judge Michelle if he would um, first begin and advise our um, audience about what the Bayh-Dole Act was, how it came into being, and why it was so important. Uh, thank you, Judge Braden, and thanks to the Washington Legal Foundation for the opportunity to explain these important issues. In the decades immediately before the Bayh-Dole Act was passed, which was in 1980, U.S. leadership, uh, particularly in health-related sciences, was beginning to falter. But there were other sectors that were also experiencing a loss of U.S. leadership and all the economic benefits that flow from that uh, leadership. 
and it became an increasing concern to the Congress. One of the things that they realized was that to regain that leadership would require massive increases in investment. And that was the basic goal of the Bayh-Dole Act, to increase investment. It did so by incentivizing private companies uh, to put up their own money to translate an upstream scientific invention by a university, for example, into an actual cure or product that a consumer could buy at a pharmacy. It was wildly successful. Before 1980, we were sinking year by year. Shortly after the passage of the act, uh, we started to take back the role of leadership and now dominate global leadership in all health-related technologies as well as, as many others. Uh, the situation before the bill was passed was that the government uh, claimed ownership of all the inventions done by research universities and other researchers if the federal government contributed any money to it. But the practical result was none of these inventions, practically none, less than 5% ever got to consumers because nobody would invest uh, in them. So Baidol made that possible by shifting ownership of the patent from the government agency that put up some of the money for the initial research to the university or other researcher itself. And the university in turn would license exclusive rights to a well-chosen private company to further develop uh, and actually manufacture and distribute the product. So we went from uh, almost none of these uh, government funded uh, upstream inventions being commercialized to all of them being commercialized on a massive scale. Judge Braden gave you some of the numbers uh, and they're, they're so dramatic. It's no surprise then that The Economist, the noted British publication that focuses on business and economics, dubbed the Bayh-Dole Act uh, the most inspiring piece of legislation to be enacted in America for over half a century. It's not an overstatement. It was a wild success, and it actually helped inspire uh, the passage of the statute creating the federal circuit in 1982, and two years later, the important Hatch-Waxman Act that facilitates the uh, entry of generic companies uh, into the drug markets. So it was a part of a move by Congress to reclaim U.S. leadership. It was hugely successful. And for reasons that I find absolutely baffling, uh, some people uh, are trying to destroy this whole system. And if they succeed with march-in rights being adopted and implemented, it, it will set us back to where we were, where there's no outside investment and no commercialization. It, it's a self-destructive uh, measure that's just hard to estimate uh, the degree of the harm, but it will be enormous for sure. I might add that there is a group that's been in existence for a very, very long time calling the Buy Dole Coalition. You can find it on your website. And at that website, you will see there's a library that has every single document from the beginning of the Buy Dole Act, um, including all the different petitions. And I wanted Judge Michelle just to mention that, that there have been petitions before to exercise march in rights and um but they've all been rejected and and can you give us some insights about why that is sure uh, the legislation itself clearly does not authorize price controls by the government there's no mention of the word control or price or the phrase price control in the statute uh, on the contrary, the entire thrust of the bill and the clear legislative purpose was to incentivize uh, investment by luring private companies to put up their own money. And the ratio is dramatic. Uh, th there are several studies, uh, but for example, uh, in a 2002 article in The Economist, uh, the publication I previously noted, uh, they concluded that a dollar's worth of academic invention partly supported by government grants, requires upwards of 10,000 in private capital to bring a product to market. Mm -hmm. 
So the ratio is enormous. Without this huge influx of private capital, uh, the upstream scientific discovery never gets translated into a product that anybody could buy at a pharmacy or, or anywhere else. So in the 43 years the act has been in existence, no administration, not Republican, not Democratic, not liberal, not conservative, none have ever interpreted the act as authorizing march in to seize the patent from the licensee and give it to somebody else uh, until the present proposal that came out last fall. Even the present Biden administration just a year ago turned down a march in petition involving the drug Xtandi, which had previously also been rejected, uh, uh, but they tried uh, again. So the, the pattern, uh, you know, is very, very clear. Um, and uh, it, it's just uh, um, astonishing to me that with that historical record being so clear and the economic benefits and leadership regaining being so clear that anybody uh, thinks for one second we should trash the whole economic uh, inventive system of financing development of actual products uh, by undermining the Baidol uh, administration. It will destroy that whole innovation ecosystem. Uh, and it's already starting to have bad effects because people are worried that a march in will actually happen. So they're holding back on investments they otherwise would be uh, making. So we're already seeing the harm. And if the uh, proposal isn't formally withdrawn, the harm will continue and it will get worse. Thank you, Chief Judge. Um, Brad Watts is our next presenter. Brad uh, worked in the Senate um, most recently for Senator Tillis. On, he was chief counsel of the IP subcommittee of the Senate Judiciary Committee and has fortunately um, assumed a position with the Chamber of Commerce as vice president of Global Innovation Policy. Um, their Global Innovation Policy Center. Um, so Brad brings a wealth of experience uh, from his work on the Hill and his leadership in this new um, center that the uh, the chamber has uh, founded. So Brad, in December, uh, explained what what happened. Uh, why were these, or what do we know about this Federal Register notice that was published? Um, changing the system that's been so successful. Um, well, thank you, Judge. And, and first off, really glad to be here with you, Judge Michelle, Ashlyn, Charles. Um, we've all, I think, worked together in various capacities for a while. And so it's kind of great to have the, the gang back together. And, and so glad uh, to be here, too, um, with all the folks that are on the webinar. I mean, this is such a great group. And as you, you know, to Judge, I mean, really doing the the groundwork to fight for our kind of first principles, free enterprise, private business, you know, private, uh, the private sector doing what it does best, right? Inventing the next big thing and letting then Americans in the world benefit from that. Um, to your direct question, Judge, you know, this guidance, and I think I can probably confidently speak for most people on this call, if not all, and say this guidance came out of nowhere, I think, for most of us. I don't think anyone anticipated it was going to drop uh, two weeks before Christmas. Um, for those who are on the call, for context, back in March of 2023, when the Biden administration most recently denied a petition to use margin rights on the basis of the pro uh, product's price, they then announced the formation of this very secretive, very quiet, um, very sleepy interagency working group to consider uh, a framework for the use of marching rights. And between March 2023 and December 2023, no one heard a thing about this group. No one knew when they were meeting, who was a member of this group, who they communicated with, what they discussed, what policies they considered, what role career versus political appointees pl played in the decision-making process. Um, to describe March to December as a period of radio silence would be an understatement. So this guidance came out in December, and I think everyone in the community who utilizes public-private partnerships from semiconductors all the way to pharmaceuticals were blindsided. Um, 
In terms of what's in this guidance for those who haven't been tracking the issue, uh, it's pretty clear. Uh, it is pretty clear that moving forward, the government will start considering whether they think the price of a product is appropriately priced. And if they disagree, they're more than willing to come in and potentially take that product from a private business who, as Judge Michelle notes, invests substantially more than any amount of federal funding that that initial product may have received and take that from them. And let's put that in the context of what that means for private enterprise. Um, let's take a, an example, Xtandi. Xtandi was, I think, the product that, um, for many who have been pushing this theory of marching rights, was the quote-unquote poster child. But most people don't realize when you hear the narrative that, oh, Xtandi was uh, developed with federal funding, therefore the taxpayer should be able to take this patent and uh, relicense it to someone at, uh, to make it at a lower price. Well, the initial federal investment for Xtandi was about $500,000. What a private sector company spent to bring that product to market was about an additional $2.8 billion. So if you do the math, I don't have my calculator on me, but you're talking about like 98 or 99% of that product's funding coming from a private sector company taking massive risk with no guarantee that product would actually end up working and treating and curing people uh, that need it. Uh, what this guidance does, though, is it signals to every business from manufacturing, from semiconductors, from tech, from green energy. It signals to people that partnering with the federal government is no longer a safe investment. It's no longer a good use of your time or money. And what's going to happen, I think we all know, and I'm sure Ashlyn and Charles will talk about this, is that people simply then are going to stop partnering with the federal government and these mom and pop research labs at universities that are trying to discover that big new thing, they're going to be the ones that suffer. Larger companies, they're simply just going to shift their business model. They have that capability. But for those researchers in a lab who are trying to discover that new big thing that's going to change the world, they're going to be the ones that suffer from this policy. Now, I'll also note, Judge, you talked about the guidance coming out in December. Um, Part of what the chamber has done is we filed FOIA requests to figure out who exactly made this process, who was involved in the decision making, who communicated with this secretive committee of bureaucrats. And so far, the administration has stonewalled us and said, we are not expediting your request. We're not going to move expeditiously. There's no need for you to get this information quickly. Um, if anything, I think that should concern everyone on this call, the total lack of transparency and accountability for such a radical policy shift, which as Judge Michelle noted, is totally contradictory to the law. Um, and that's why the chamber has organized a new coalition uh, of business groups to fight against this policy and also to defend the free enterprise system. Um, we're preparing to launch this coalition next Wednesday at an event on Capitol Hill, and I would love to invite all of you and all the people on this call to attend as we band together to defend the private sector enterprises that are doing what they do best, inventing products and developing the next big thing. And I'll drop the link for that event in the chat and would love to see all you there and then uh, happy to turn it over to my fellow co-panelists and answer questions at the end. Um, thank you, Brad. Uh, two uh, points. One is it's interesting that who was not on that group. The Patent Office wasn't part of this working group. NIH, none of the um, agencies in the government that have expertise, Department of Education for that matter, um, were involved in any of this. And obviously, um, that makes you kind of wonder how this was, how they came up with these guidelines without having any input from the companies and the other, the people even within the government that had the most expertise in the area. Um, that's one thing. And the second thing is there's been no, no one that I am aware of other than two or three different academic writers, one of which at Yale, has even asked to have the March in Rights um, issue addressed or changed. So we're, we're trying to figure out exactly what is the constituency for this policy initiative. Um, to the extent that it, it's aimed at um, pharmaceutical patents, um, as we'll discuss, I mean, it's, it's not going to do that. It's, that's got, it's, it's a total waste of their time if that's what they're trying to do, unless this is just, you know, eyewash um, politically uh, to make people feel that the administration is doing something. Um, the other Judge, thing really 
Yes, please. I would, I would just build on that and say you're exactly right. This is a, a solution in search of a problem. Only about 8% of pharmaceutical products on the market right now took any level of federal funding. And right. again, that is often de minimis when you compare that to the private sector investment. But again, who this is really going to hurt are those researchers in the lab that are trying to develop that cutting edge next generation technology, right? Think about your classic example of a couple of scientists in a university lab who may be developing general artificial intelligence, but they're taking some level of federal funding. Well, as Ashton's probably going to talk about, those guys are going to depend on angel share investors, private sector capital to build off that very de minimis amount of federal funding they got to potentially get a new product, something that's revolutionary, that's going to make life better for all of us. Those are going to be the folks who are impacted. Um, and so it's, it's a farce to say that somehow this is going to change drug pricing, when in reality, most pharmaceutical products never take federal dollars to begin with. But those cutting edge, te cutting edge technologies that are coming out of university labs, they're the ones, as we're in a global innovation race to continue to be the world's leader, they're the ones that are going to suffer. Uh, thank you. I wanted to get to that 8% number because I think that's pretty critical, right? Um, patents. Um, Ashlyn uh, Roberts is the Senior Director of Government Affairs for the National Venture Capital Association. This is a relatively new player in Washington, and but an essential group um, in the ecosystem that Chief Judge Michelle talks about. Ashlyn? Tell us who your members are and why they're concerned. Absolutely. Thank you, Judge Braden and the Washington Legal Foundation for having me. And I will say fun fact that um, the National Venture Capital Association, actually, we just entered our 50th year. So we've been around for a little bit, but I will say that the uh, us weighing in so heavily on the, the March in proposal is um, just the wide swath of impact that it would have on our membership. And so just to share a little bit more about NVCA, we're an advocacy organization for venture capitalists across the United States supporting the American entrepreneurial ecosystem. And so our members span from um, family offices to the larger uh, venture capital organizations that you may be familiar with and kind of everywhere in between covering every really silo. Uh, we have folks that invest in defense, uh, healthcare, energy, Everyone is, of course, very interested in AI right now. And so largely, uh, if there is some private investment, our membership touches it. And so to provide the venture capital perspective on this rule, um, we did weigh in heavily, of course, in opposition uh, through our comment to NIST, and then also to a letter directly to the president um, earlier this year. Uh, and it really was largely due to the sheer expansiveness of the role and the impact across all sectors. Of course, I don't need to belabor the fact that IP drives commercial enterprise with this group. Uh, I know that estimates uh, are about 84% of the value of S&P 500 companies comes from intangible assets like patents, trademarks, and propri proprietary information. As it relates to investment more directly, IP is very often one of the most critical factors that leads to funding in a company. Startups with an approved patent application are 59% more likely to obtain VC funding within three years of obtaining a patent. And the IP system is already challenging and for entrepreneurs and investors to navigate. So really this March in proposal, if implemented, would further complicate the space, but really decimate the trust among VCs in the federal government's role within patents in every capacity. And Despite the framing that, of course, it would mainly impact the healthcare industry, we really do have concern that it has the potential to impact any patented license from the federal government to any company with federal research grants, uh, including SBIR companies. And we have celebrated a lot of these funding programs in the past aimed at bolstering public-private investments and partnerships, but this framework is counterintuitive in nature to these same economic stimulus programs that we have championed, uh, like the American Rescue Plan Act, which provided $10 billion for the state small business credit initiative and the Chips and Science Act, which of course provided uh, $250 billion in semiconductor and scientific R&D, and then also authorized that $10 billion regional tech hub program. 
all of which could be subject under this March in proposal for forfeited patent rights. Now, specifically on healthcare, I will say that I've heard from VCs investing in biopharmaceutical, biotech, medtech spaces that have a significant number of companies they have that they see that I've had grant funding either when one, the product or technology being developed is in the academic setting or two, as part of another government funding source. And so while these discoveries, discoveries are critical importance to the healthcare ecosystem more generally, as my colleagues here have mentioned today, it is really the venture funding that is able to finance this critical R&D that is needed to build and grow these discoveries tenfold. Um, pitch, pitch book data actually shows from 2023 alone that MedTech VC investment dollars funded around 835 deal counts at around $11.2 billion alone, and Biopharma VC investment dollars funded around 920 deals at around $29.9 billion. And so it's a lot of, of, of our venture funding in a, in a high risk um, environment with a long time horizon. And so the risk that the government could have some claim on a lot of uh, this IP really would stif stifle enthusiasm in investment, especially understanding that a lot of the, this initial medical discovery may have originated out of a university lab or government um, ex research. Um, I, I'm, I'll, I'll, to make myself not keep rambling, I'll, I'll pause there, but I will say that um, one VC did express to me how Marchin really would put a cloud over IP, where moving forward, there would be uncertainty if the federal government would, of course, overstep these precedents and negatively impact a deal moving forward. And so really with a lot of our venture being high risk, close calls to either invest or pass on investment, um, definitely if this proposal moves forward, the VC uh, distrust in um, these sort, these government originated patents um, will be absolutely decimated. And definitely the way that uh, folks are approaching investment in these types of companies um, is already changing and we're seeing that here. John, um, can I intervene to go back to the course. basic point uh, that this uh, framework that's proposed last December has no basis in the statute at all and no basis in any other statute. Congress has chosen not to amend this 43 year old law to deal with anything like pricing. And in addition to pricing, it, it allows the federal government to confiscate patent licenses from private companies that paid for them, not only based on price, but based on any other term in the private sales agreement between private parties. So this is a, a, an astonishingly uh, uh, wild uh, theory. I think and the word it, you're so looking for is socialist. Well, that's exactly it, what this it, is. It, it, it's also illegal. It's flatly it illegal, illegal. Uh, which is just startling. And not only does it emerge from this secretive group, as Brad mentioned, but it never was vetted by any of the normal authorities. Normally, if there's going to be a new interpretation of a bill, particularly after 43 years, there's a formal legal opinion from uh, the relevant part of the Justice Department. Not done here. No legal opinion that has surfaced from anybody. So no this cost benefit analysis, no nothing. Yeah. Exactly. So this is illegal and harmful and with no justification offered uh, even by the task force that is proposing it. It's preposterous. Uh, well, I was when I was listening to Ash and I looked um to remind myself, uh, let me give you, this is a stark example of what Baidol resulted in. Google is a result of Baidol. Google was formed by two guys in doing a research project um, who were both PhD students at Stanford, uh, Larry Page and Sergey Brin. Now that is a good example of, of the success of Baidol. Um, the second thing that in terms of who the stat, the these guidelines don't even define what reasonable pricing is, nor who would make that decision. Um, it's hard to see how some GS11 is going to decide that um, technology, green technology or 
you can, you know, uh, semiconductors. I mean, all the things that, that, that Charles is going to talk about be, be affected by all of this. Who's going to make this decision? What background or criteria will they have and who will review it? Um, it's really, it is, it's socialism gone amok. And you might as well call it for what it is. Um, they also ignore that if the government seizes private property, it's going to end up very likely having to pay for it by the tens or hundreds of billions of dollars. So that doesn't help taxpayers or consumers. That's just an additional harm flowing from this crazy proposal. Right. Well, you know, the first line of, of uh, fighting on this is going to be universities. So universities are going to have to go through a quasi-judicial process to determine whether or not these marching uh, provisions uh, should be exercised or not. They're going to have to assume the cost of all of that uh, instead of using that money to teach students, which is really what their job is. And if somebody decides they want to file a lawsuit, they would wind up in my old court, uh, the Court of Federal Claims. Um, and assuming that the judges there would find that uh, private property had been taken at a certain price, uh, guess who winds up paying for that? It's affirmed by your court, the taxpayers. So it's basically uh, transferring a tax on the American public in addition to all these other negative benefits. Um, I'm going to segue to Charles Crane, and I um, Charles is. Uh, uh, the Vice President of Domestic Policy at the National Association of Manufacturers, which is a really amazing trade group. I worked with them many years ago when I was general counsel to Steel Mill, but they've grown far more uh, important in terms of different segments of the economy. Um, and uh, it, with all of the groups that have been f have filed comments, uh, they filed an extraordinarily good one, um, which you can find on the Baidol Coalition website. Um, Charles, let me have you talk about the breadth of this, and then I want to have you mention concerns about some national security concerns that have come out from this proposal. Absolutely. Thank you, Judge Braden. Great sure. to be here uh, with everybody at the Washington Legal Foundation and, and certainly my fellow panelists. Uh, as Judge Braden just mentioned, the National Association of Manufacturers, the NAM, uh, represents 14,000 members, uh, 14,000 manufacturers across the country in really a wide range of industries. And that's sort of the preview of my remarks here, which is that, yes, we actually do represent biopharmaceutical manufacturers. We, all, we also have steel makers. We have automotive companies. We have chips companies. Um, we have wide range of technology, medical device. I mean, it really is anything. And one thing that those companies all have in common is their manufacturers, so they're members of ours. And the other thing is that a lot of times they get federal funding through public-private partnerships in a lot of different arenas, whether it's at the early stage or later. We've talked about the Chips and Science Act, which is something the NAM strongly supported, which is obviously much later stage funding. So our members collectively have, have really expressed concerns here. I want to take one step back to kind of set the stage, um, you know, Judge Michelle just highlighted the sort of degree of unlawfulness here, which, which I think is exactly correct. One thing that our attendees may or may not know is that there actually is a march in provision in the Bayh-Dole Act. So NIST and the White House haven't like in the last three months invented the concept of Bayh-Dole. But I think it's it's worth noting that Congress is very intentional in how they crafted that provision. So the government is allowed under Bayh-Dole to, quote unquote, march in and and license, you know, to take the license to these patents developed with federal funding for very specific reasons that are not priced. So the that provision is is written to allow for the government to say to a manufacturer who's sort of sitting on a patent and not producing anything in a time of national crisis where there's a shortage of something that the public really needs access to and the manufacturer is refusing to produce it, okay, the government can step in and solve that national crisis because there's that hook of the federal funding way back in the, in the development process. Price controls are not that. Right. And so that's what the, the disconnect is here is these these draft guidelines contemplate price controls based on, quote, unquote, unfair pricing criteria, which has been said already, is not defined in any substantive way. So with respect to the, the breadth and depth of the impact here, the administration has really solely talked about this in 
the framework of drug pricing. Now, as I said, we represent biopharmaceutical manufacturers. Both Ashlyn and Brad have already talked about the damage that would be done in the biopharmaceutical space. You know, I don't think, I don't think anyone thinks that we want to dampen innovation in life-saving medicines. And that's absolutely the impact that price controls would have in that space. But I want to underscore the degree to which that this is really not just about biopharmaceutical innovation. It's about innovation across the economy. If you think about semiconductors, if you think about artificial intelligence and green energy, renewable energy, advanced batteries, many, many, many things, because the government is very, very, very large, have received some amount of federal funding at some point. The government does a fantastic job, frankly, at doling out these individual grants through various programs like SBAR. The NIH obviously has significant amount of funding for this in the biopharma space uh, to do that early stage research, to work with universities, to ensure that these early stage discoveries are made when there isn't yet a commercial, an obvious commercial pathway for them, right? The government is great at that. But if we impose price controls, then all of that great funding is just going to sit on the shelf, right? Uh, and so there's there's real impacts across the suite of different technologies that the federal government has invested in at that early stage that sort of ignores the fact, as Brad highlighted, that it takes an additional $2 billion to actually turn them into a product. It just focuses on that initial two, four, six hundred thousand dollar grant, which is critically important, critically important, but that's not all it takes to to develop a product. And then to, to Judge Braden's point, when you think about price controls, which are bad to begin with, uh, Judge Braden used the term socialism, and I think she's not wrong. Um, this is, it's not like these are price controls set by somebody with expertise in the economy that we might want to be setting price controls. We don't want anybody to be setting price controls. But if you're going to do it, at least have somebody who knows about pricing, right? Instead, these that are the, product. Right. Yeah. These are instead, these are the individual agencies that are making these grants. Their job is to to look at how smart the university professor is. And does she need $200,000 for what may or may not be a really interesting idea? That's their expertise, is looking at the molecule, the molecule that she's researching and saying, is this worth a few dollars of government money? Not what in 10 years should the price of the product that results from that molecule cost, right? It doesn't even hold water when, when I say it as one sentence, right? And so the idea that those bureaucrats, the GS-11s, to use Judge Braden's term, have any expertise or ability to evaluate what pricing should be and therefore to set price controls based on that is sort of laughable. And you can really understand what the impact on the innovation economy would be if folks are are butting up against those potential controls. And the thing that I think is most compelling here, or most illustrative of, of the damage is that we don't have to imagine what that would look like because we had this before by Dole. Um, there is sort of existing literature, research, and contemporaneous analysis from pre-1980 about the state of commercialization of federally funded innovation, which is to say it didn't exist. <laughs> Only 4% of government-held patents ever became a uh, an actual commercialized product. Venture capitalists, early-stage entrepreneurs, manufacturers viewed federal funding as contaminating, that's a direct quote from folks at the time, as contaminating any effort to actually bring that to market. So just no one did it. It didn't exist. Only 4% ever went anywhere. And so we don't have to pretend and extrapolate and, and sort of brainstorm what the impact of this might be. We just have to turn back the clock and look at what the impact was. And Congress stepped in in a bipartisan manner to fix that, right? And so there's, there's absolutely no reason to turn back the clock to that time. Uh, and so I think a key thing to take away here for our attendees uh, is that really this proposal needs to be repudiated and affirmatively withdrawn. You know, we, a lot of us have been active in, in DC for a long time. A lot of times what when, when we sort of oppose something or we want it to, to not come to, into being, the hope is for it to sort of die on the vine, right? There's a proposal that's never finalized. There's a bill that's introduced and it never gets a committee markup, right? We see this all the time in DC. The risk with March in is that if this is proposed but never finalized by this administration, there's still the cloud hanging over the entire innovation mm -hmm. ecosystem from the fact that somebody thought this was a good idea and it's sitting on a shelf somewhere at NIST in the White House, even if the administration changes in the future, where they could easily pick this back up. And so if you're a venture capitalist and you're thinking about an investment in an early stage biotech company that's going to take 15 years to play out, 
it doesn't actually give you all that much comfort if this administration in 2024 doesn't finalize this proposal. If at some point in the next 15 years, this administration or a future one might pick it back up off the shelf. So it's not that we don't want to see this administration finalize this. We certainly don't. But we really need a robust repudiation of the concepts underpinning this specific document to really give entrepreneurs, university researchers, venture capitalists, manufacturers the ability to continue to invest in the ecosystem that has made the U.S. the leader in these types of innovation. So that's that's really what I think the takeaway here is here is that this really needs to be significantly walked back, taken away, rescinded, repudiated, disclaimed to the greatest extent possible in order in order to support the type of innovation that we want to see on a going forward basis. Judge we, Michelle, need, we need the innovation desperately at the strategic global level because we're being hugely challenged by China all over the world. And China is investing its own resources enormously in trying to overtake U.S. leadership in technology. According to one recent report done partly funded by our State Department by a think tank in Australia, China is already leading the U.S., in 37 out of 44 advanced technologies. This uh, uh, framework, if implemented, would make that far, far worse and very, very rapidly. And the other thing that is worth mentioning, going back to the lack of authorities, how did they justify doing this? It's based on an academic article 23 years ago that, as a matter of theory, played with the word access. The access had to do with whether the product would be commercialized and put on the shelves. But the academics said, no, no, access means affordability. Well, it didn't. It clearly wasn't in the thinking of the of the sponsors of the bill as they wrote in 2002, shortly after this article came out. So this is a long discredited article that's being revived uh, apparently for political and PR reasons, but it's, it's been thoroughly rejected and and debunked. And it's just linguistic trickery to say that uh, price controls uh, are a part of whether the product is accessible uh, on shelves. Can I, can I just add uh, two things there as well, Judge Braden? Um, it, two, two key points. Um, and Judge Michelle, you, you said a buzzword that I think is really important for the attendees, for the people who are going to view this um, and, you know, get knowledgeable on this subject to understand. The public does get access to these inventions because a patent term doesn't run forever. A patent term is a limited grant of exclusivity, right? And part of the benefit to the public is that a private sector actor, you know, people like Charles members, Ashland's members, invest a lot of money. A lot of money on a lot of times on products that don't come to market that fail and they lose a lot of money. But on those products that are successful, they take significant risks. They bring that product to market. They have to recoup their investment. But then after the patent term runs and it's not that long, you know, it's 20 years on paper, but we all know significantly less in practice by the time you get the product to market. When that then runs, the public can make free use of that knowledge. You know, part of the reasons why we're not stuck in the Middle Ages anymore is because the great guild system from the Middle Ages, where knowledge was constrained and locked up and not available, is gone. Intellectual property protections play a role in that, in transferring that knowledge to the public domain in return for getting a limited exclusive right. And so I, to your point about the, the legal jargon, Judge, I mean, one thing those who are pushing this policy fail to mention is that the public ultimately gets access after a very short period of time, and they have that forever. And the entire public can utilize that. Competitors can utilize that. And that's the beautiful thing about our market economy is then you have all these different variations of the products and improvements. And again, it all leads to one thing, making lives better and easier for everyone. That's a wonderful point, Brad. Judge Michelle, you were reading my mind because I was going to come back to you on the um, national security issue. And one of the things that we haven't talked about is the standing requirement. Who can bring a petition? It can be anybody, and it could be a competitor from China. Well, not only that, but uh, 
they can be filed uh, at any one of the 20 or so agencies that fund research. So you have 20 different agencies to contend with, potentially. Secondly, uh, they can be filed repeatedly. Repeated petitions have been filed in the recent past regarding that drug I mentioned earlier called Xtandi. So you can have uh, repeat uh, proceedings which are very expensive, very slow, uh, and which will put a burden on research universities and their exclusive licensees to defend against. So it, 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 it gives a legal gun to competitors and foreign actors to impose costs and risks on people that we should be supporting, not handicapping. It's just extraordinary to me that this is even getting any kind of serious uh, attention to the point of being issued as a proposed so-called framework. Uh, and, you know, a, a framework is totally different, legally speaking, from a regulation uh, or a statute uh or even a formal policy it's a it's a, it's a, a an un, a legally unrecognized animal and i think the reason they just call it a framework is they're terrified that if they call if they put it in a regulation there'll be a lawsuit and it will be declared illegal full stop so they dangle this out as uh something that can't be legally attacked because such an attack would be premature uh, because there's no implementation yet and there's no formal legal uh, status of it. But it's already having the bad effect that Charles and Ashlyn uh, have talked about uh, on the thinking of uh, venture capitalists and other people too, even in established companies. Uh, executives can't justify uh, risky investments, uh, often expensive and slow to mature uh, uh, based on uh, rights that can be taken away at a whim by a federal agency based on no standards. It's a completely crazy uh, system. It's just a shocking uh, travesty that we're even having to talk about this. Judge Braden, uh, Action, could I jump please. In? Thank you. Please. I just to kind of echo this point, um, I definitely a big point of concern is the fact that anyone can file a march in petition. Uh, many of the CEOs of our portfolio companies often work with small teams with limited capacity in the workforce. And so this draft framework really allows large corporations that have the capacity to file countless margin petitions against these smaller companies, um, really just leaving the, these smaller companies with the financial and administrative burdens that they just truly cannot handle. Um, and then to your point that there is no reason that a larger company with the capacity could not file limitless um, uh, petitions on these smaller companies is is definitely a concern for a lot of our our groups. Um, I know that the the framework mentioned um, a three D printing technology startup um, and the, the the way that it kind of was um, that I we all read it um, over at MBCA was that um, the these giant corporations or more established companies would be able to file these petitions against this startup that maybe isn't showing um, quick enough uh, commercialization of the product or service. That's definitely a concern of ours. Well, and I'll just like to, I mean, I love that point, Ashlyn. And look, I think the good chunk of the folks on this call are lawyers, a good chunk of the people that are going to listen to this are lawyers. Um, but every dollar we take from a company and give to a lawyer because they're having to defend against a petition is one less dollar that can be used to bring a new product to the market that ultimately benefits the public, right? The lawyers may be happy because it's more money for them, but the reality is the public doesn't benefit from that, right? Because if a small startup that your members are working with is having to take half a million dollars out of a $3 million budget, that's a lot less money to potentially get that really cool thing into the hands of the public. And, and, you know, independent of any motives from a company, foreign or domestic, for filing one, we all know the more money that goes to litigation, the less money businesses have to actually innovate, market, bring that product to people. I was going to mention, you know, when I, I retired, I had an opportunity to join the board of a company that was um, founded out of Carnegie Mellon. Uh, and it had some, you know, research money behind it. And what they did is they used artificial intelligence and proprietary software to review large, uh, to review contracts. 
Um, and basically our customers were like insurance companies that would have tons of different contracts with different provisions of them. And uh, many times they're trying to get them all, you know, organized and, and in sync. And if we had been, um, we were funded by two, primarily by two uh, Midwest uh, venture capital companies. They were small and a lot of what you, we, they call friends and family, but you know, the thing. And if we had been hit by, by having one of these lawsuits, particularly during COVID, we would have had to fold. We just could not have, we were having problems as it was, you know, kind of get, keeping the company moving during COVID. We were successful in doing that. We were successful in managing our cash. And eventually last year, we were successful in selling it to a larger um, venture capital group out of California. But during those early years, um, it, it was at, is that you can't, there's no margin for error by having to go through all this additional regulatory uh, process, even if we got through it. Uh, it would just, it would have killed the company. And um, I fear very much for so many companies that are out there right now that were that are in this position. Um, you know, the whole point of getting these companies to a certain size is to, to exit and then to be able to take the money for the investment banking firms and do it again with other firms. And that's the beauty of our system. And the damage is in, incalculable. Um, uh, Charles, one of the things I was thinking about, and I talked about this in a different context, but let's assume for the moment that I make some type of special tire with re this type of research. And the, the government decides they don't like my, the price of my tires. So they come in and they say, you know, Brayton, you can't use the patented technology that you have, but of course I've built a factory and I have, you know, inventory and I have customers. What's the impact? It's more than just taking a piece of paper away from me. What impact that they had on my business? Yeah, I think that's a really illustrative example, Judge Braden. It shows the degree to which this impacts up and down in terms of size of companies and different types and industries of companies. You know, if you think about a small business that isn't maybe quite as mature as your tire company that you've founded, congratulations, um, you know, they maybe only have one patent and they aren't producing anything yet. And so the threat to undermine their intellectual property threatens their existence as a business, right, as, as you right. outlined. As you move further on into maturity of a company, if they are dependent on intellectual property, as so many innovative businesses are, and in fact, innovative businesses are the only ones that are impacted here because the way that you're hooked in is that you have patent rights that they want to seize. Um, the, the later in your life cycle that you are and still dependent on a patent or a, a small subset of patents means that if, if they're going to expropriate that patent, then that disrupts your business operations as opposed to for the smaller business it's just your business model uh your business operations so it could mean that you you it has impact on workers impact on production impact on consumers and um you know the entire marketplace and sort of everyone you have supply chain relationships with um and so that's why i think that you have seen the degree of concern about this proposal from so many different industries and so many different groups that represent the smallest of the small startup and entrepreneurs to the largest of the large producers and manufacturers and everyone in between, because what underpins all of those companies' businesses are intellectual property rights. Patent rights are protected by the Constitution for a reason, uh, and yet this secretive committee of bureaucrats wants to undermine them for purposes that are, are really uh, antithetical to, to the innovation ecosystem and the Bayh-Dole Act specifically. I see that we have about five minutes left and I don't have any questions in the queue or in the, the chat. If there are questions, this would be an appropriate time to, to let us know. Um, Judge Braden, if I would just like to add one more point. Sure, um, please. If we hadn't uh, noted on it, that this is um, both for patents that are of already commercialized inventions as well as future in inventions. So I think yes. that's just worth noting. Yeah, it's absolutely you, retroactive. Yeah. Let you me have uh, Ashlyn. I mean, the retroactivity of this. I mean, look, even if it was prospective, that's horrible. 
But the retroactivity piece, I mean, you're a company now who, like Charles noted, you may be 12 years into making your product. And all of a sudden now you have to sit there and contend with this threat. I mean, and let's not forget too, innovation is living, right? Most companies don't make one product and then never touch it again. They're always trying to figure out how do I make it better, more efficient, faster, sexier, so the public wants to buy more, right? And again, if you're looking here 12 years out from having partnered with a small startup to get this product on market, I can't imagine those are fun conversations in the C-suite right now. Brad, I want you to conclude basically by, let's conclude by the way forward and the group that you're putting together, which is not, does not involve pharmaceutical companies and um, what any of the listeners or people who will view this webinar can do to be helpful. Actually, Judge Brady, can I jump in real quick with a question? Sure, Glenn. So one of the things that we posted on the website uh, for this program was the comment of the Federal Trade Commission. And uh, uh -huh, I think it's a yes. real reflection of where things stand in this country right now in, in terms of, of uh, competition policy that the FTC is supportive of what NIST is doing here. And I, I welcome anybody's thoughts on that uh, for the benefit of our, of our viewers. Brad, you want, you want to take that and then you can segue to your... Um, I, I don't want to... Uh, misspeak. Uh, all I will say is my colleague, Sean Heather at the chamber who leads our antitrust work, um, our positions on this current FTC are pretty well known. Um, and so I will just, uh, to not get myself fired, leave it at that. <laughs> well, I worked with the Federal Trade Commission and I I will tell you, I think the, they have exceeded their authority uh, in more than one way and in more than one area. And um, I hope it doesn't come back to, you know, endanger the agency, because, but there is certainly this gives a, the, those of you who remember Mike Perchek and the national nanny uh, label that he had, um, there's a good argument to be made that we don't need the Federal Trade Commission. We can do antitrust enforcement out of the Justice Department, and there are other agencies that can do consumer protection. And if they're looking for, a, a, you know, a, um, they need things to do, uh, to move the staff to other places. Judge, can I just add one quick point that sure. was elided earlier? Uh, the patent statute is crystal clear that a patent is a form of property. Correct. It has all the attributes of personal property. In our country, in our legal system, under our rule of law, the government is not permitted and its own initiative to seize private property, full stop. That's exactly what's being uh, yeah. proposed here. It's a, another way of illustrating how illegal this is. And if they can seize patents, what's next? Uh, they're gonna seize your uh, certificate of deposit at your bank or, or your stock in General Motors or, or what? Because in our system, we don't allow the government to seize private property. Uh, except under extremely limited circumstances of which this is not one for controlling prices. And I'll just add to, I mean, look, I think the the reality of this here too, for all watching this live and watching the recording is um, kind of like when you start dating someone um, and they, first time they stay over, it's fine. Second time they stay over, it's fine. But then third or fourth time they leave a toothbrush, right? It's like mission creep to relationship. Um, this is mission creep to seizing patents and other technologies, because right now it's framed as a pharma issue, because for whatever reason, despite the fact this industry has saved millions of lives, this administration wants to demonize them. It's not going to stop there. This will be mission creep to, as Charles noted, whatever the next sexy technology is that people are unhappy about because they can't get it for dirt cheap, uh, that's going to be the next thing on the chopping block. And we have to be cognizant of the fact that we can't let this become mission creep to essentially a centralized planned economy where the government decides they don't like the price of something and they threaten a business, threaten to take that property right from that business until they get the price they want. Brad, 30 seconds on your group. Absolutely. So the Chamber of Commerce, again, next week is launching this broad business coalition. Uh, it's composed of non-pharmaceutical companies, Everything from manufacturing, semiconductors, chips, techs, conservative legal groups, scholars, 
And the point is we're going to tell the story about how public-private partnerships benefits the whole innovation ecosystem. We're going to flip the script, change the narrative, and the Chamber's uh, getting ready to put several million dollars into this effort to get out into the country, educate the public, tell those stories, create grassroots advocacy so that lawmakers understand when they support, quote unquote, marching rights or they don't stand up to fight marching rights, they're hurting every town in the USA where innovation occurs. Thank you very much. And thank you, Glenn, and to the Washington Legal Foundation. Um, we all have a lot of work to do this year. Absolutely. Thanks, everyone, for joining us today. Thank you to the panelists for your time. Uh, as, as I noted at the outset, this was being recorded. So if anybody wishes to watch it uh, in its entirety later or share it with anyone, it'll be available on our website, wlf.org. Thanks again to everyone. Bye-bye.